Well, thank you for joining me as we restart Adult Sunday School, even though it is probably not Sunday while you are watching this. For, obviously, uh, for obvious reasons, we cannot get together in this classroom like we normally do on a Sunday morning. But through modern technology, we are going to meet anyway. And I want to thank Bruce for the huge part he is playing in making that and allowing that to happen. And by the way, if you happen to hear a strange clicking sound, don't worry, it's not your computer, it's my knees knocking together. So, let's get started. If you don't have a Bible with you, pause the recording here and get one so you can follow along and have it open to Revelation chapter 3. So let's get this class time started. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the game show, Let's Make a Deal. Over here, I have two boxes. I'm going to lift them up in a second. And two boxes of different sides. And if inside, each of the, one of the, if inside one of these boxes is a prize, which box would you pick? So here's the boxes. First, we have a small box. There may be a prize in here. Here we have a big box. There may be a prize in here. But if you have to pick one of these two boxes, and you could only pick one, would you pick the small one? Or the big one? Which one would you pick? Which one would you pick? There are two familiar sayings that explain why people would probably choose one or the other. See if you can finish this saying for me. Good things come in small packages. Those of you who chose the larger box obviously don't believe that. You probably probably believe the other saying, the bigger the better. That is why my wife chose me, by the way, the bigger the better. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> In general, the idea of the bigger the better is probably the more popular of the two. I mean, whether we admit it or not, most of us think that way, the bigger the better. I mean, just look at a house. If you're going to examine or possibly purchase a house and you go to show homes, which ones intrigue you? The little guys or the monster structures? 4,000 square feet and more. Which ones seem like a better house? The bigger, the better. You don't like that one? How about going to a car lot? Do you, are you drawn to the big cars or the big trucks, or are you drawn to the little mini cars? Most of us are drawn to the bigger cars. And the same thing goes with the diamond ring. You get a diamond ring for your, for your, your fiancé or your wife. The bigger the better, right? Or even a paycheck. Well, sometimes bigger is better, but sometimes it isn't. Question, which is better, a big church congregation or a small church congregation, which is better, and why? What are the advantages of each? What's the advantage of a large church congregation? Well, obviously you have more members, therefore you have a bigger budget. More offering is coming in, more resources to work with, you can have more programs, you can have more activities, you might have a trained professional worship leader. You might have professionals teaching a Sunday school class such as this. People trained in seminary, on staff. That's some of the advantages of a big church. A smaller church congregation, what's, what's their advantages? Because they have some too. When you go to a small church, there's intimacy. You see people around you and everybody knows each other. And if somebody's missing, you know they're missing because they're not where they normally are in the church pew. And we know each other's problems. We're intimate with each other in a small congregation. So there are advantages to both. Today we're going to see if Jesus thinks that a church has to be big to be better. We're going to stop for a moment. Have you ever been on a long drive and you feel the need to stop? I mean, we've been driving for hours and hours, and frankly, we have to pull over. Well, this happens to me all the time when I'm driving any distance with my wife, Linda. With all our driving trips, it's stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And it's worse when Linda drinks coffee. Stop, I have to go again. 
Before coronavirus threw our world into upheaval, we in this Sunday school class in this room were studying the seven churches of Revelation. We've laid low for a month now, but we've been going over, going over some very dusty, dirty roads, going from one decrepit town, one decrepit city to another. And in the last three stops alone, we toured the bug-infested city of Pergamum. And then we left that place and we took the exit off the highway into Thyatira. Remember Thyatira? The city where anything goes? The same thing with the church? Anything goes? And remember the last church we studied? We visited the ghost town of Sardis, the city of the dead, the church of the dead. Remember that one? Well, we've driven for a month since then without stopping anywhere. We've dealt with coronavirus. We've dealt with no restaurants being open. We've dealt with grocery stores and lineups just to buy toilet paper. Even pot shops are closing down. I think we all deserve a break, don't you? Just imagine we're on that highway and we're driving. Hey, look, there's a tour, there's a sign. It went by too fast. I didn't see it. Philly something, Philodendrum, I think it was. Something like that. Well, who cares what the town's called? We have to pull over off the highway. We have to pull over sooner or later. I mean, Linda has to go. So let's stop. Let's fuel up, have a bathroom break, maybe get a takeout meal, and see what's happening in this little town of Philly Who. Well, look, there's, there's a tourist information station right over there. And it's still open. Let's, stop. Let's find out something about this town. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. What's the name of the town? It's not Philodendron. It's not Philly. It's right there. Philadelphia. 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 That's the name of this city, that we're, this town that we're going into. And by the way, this is not the city in Pennsylvania, just in case you're confused. This city is in present day Turkey. Now, does anybody know what the Greek word Philadelphia means? You probably do. You've heard it. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, brotherly affection. That's what Philadelphia in Greek means. This city, Philadelphia, is the youngest of the seven cities of Revelation. It was founded about 200 years earlier by Attalus. Attalus was the king of Pergamum. We, talk, we studied about Pergamum a few, few weeks back. He was the king of that area. Now, King Attalus had such a deep admiration and such a deep affection for his older brother, Eumenus. He was the former king. That Attalus named this new city in honor of his older brother, Eumenus. Hence the name Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia was not a very big city, but it had a very but it had very rich soil, which made it extremely important for agriculture, especially grapes. A lot of grapes were being grown in this region and still are. The city was devastated in 17 AD by the same earthquake which hit the, the previous church, Sardis. If you remember when we studied Sardis, they were destroyed by an earthquake, the same one, 1780. By the time John pens this book of Revelation, 80 years later now, the city has been rebuilt and is again a thriving, lush farming community. That's Philadelphia. And look, if you look in this city, there's a church. So let's leave the tourist information center and stop and see what's happening in this local church in this town of Philadelphia. This is the sixth of the seven churches that Revelation is originally emailed to. Jesus, through the pen of John, is giving each an evaluation. He is giving each a report card. As he does in each of his report cards to these churches, Jesus, Jesus follows a similar format. And I have it on the board here. You might be able to see it. First, he says who the message, who the email is going to. Then he says who the email is from. Then he talks about the good points of that church, what they're doing well, the positives, the things that they're getting A pluses on their report card. And then he goes to the bad things. 
the things that they aren't doing so well, the things that need to be beefed up in order to get a passing grade. And then after that, following the format, Jesus gives them some advice. And after the advice, he gives them a warning. What happens if they don't follow the advice in most cases? And finally, he gives them promises. Promises of what happens to those and how they will be rewarded if they follow the advice, follow the warnings, and clean up their act if they need to be cleaned up. So that's the format in each of these churches. But the first thing he does is identify who it is being sent to. And we've already seen that this one is going to Philadelphia. Actually, it's going to the angel. Another word for angel, messenger of the church in Philadelphia. I take that to mean the pastor. So this is going to the pastor, in my opinion, of the church in Philadelphia. And then again, following the format, Jesus tells who this emailed report card is coming from. I'm going to have Linda read Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, the first verse, as we talk about this church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can Does to each of the other churches, Jesus reveals aspects about himself to this congregation. What he reveals to this church can best be separated into two categories, his character and his control. First, we see his character. What two specific words in the verse that Linda just read, verse 7, do you see describing the character of Christ? While you think about it, I'm going to put them on the board, see if you got the same ones I'm writing. You see them? Holy, true, holy and true. How would you define the word holy? We use it all the time. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What does holy mean? Well, I checked with old man Webster, and he gave me these words to define holy. And these are his words. Sacred, pure, blameless. This is how Jesus is describing his character. This is who this email is coming from. Someone who is holy and true. Jesus Christ himself. This is how Jesus describes himself. And then he asks for that. Sacred, pure, blameless, and true. And this is Jesus the Christ. It's his report card. And never forget that. This is not John the Apostle's report card. This is Jesus Christ's report card to this church. And that's who it's from. We also see Jesus emphasizing his control. We just talked about his character, holy and true. He, he says, I hold the key, the key of David. Now, what in the world is that? Well, flip over to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, and see how this Old Testament prophet, hundreds of years earlier, describes the coming Messiah. Linda, would you read that, please? I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Okay, thank you. It's exactly the same words as in this verse 7 of Revelation 3, isn't it? Almost exactly the same wording. What does a key do? What's the purpose of a key? It locks and unlocks doors. In my pocket, I pulled out a set of keys. This one here, this is the key to my house. You might be able to see that. Whether well, it's better this way, I don't know. This is the key to my car. This one over here, that's the key to my mailbox. Now, right now, each one of these things, as I'm in this Sunday school class, all three of them are locked. The car is locked outside, my house at home is locked, and the mailbox is, box is locked. But I have control. I have the keys. And I think Jesus is saying, with this key of David, I have control. But control of what? A house? A car? A mailbox? Well, let's find out. Would you read verse 8, Linda, please? Revelation chapter 3. I know your deeds, 
See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Thank you. Still following the same format that we have on the board here. Still following that format, Jesus compliments them on their strengths. The subjects on their report card that they are getting great grades in, passing grades, good marks. What is the first positive that this church is commended for? It's right there in what Linda just read. I know your what? Deeds. I know your deeds. That in itself is not necessarily a good point, but we're going to put it up there anyway. But I know your deeds. You're doing stuff. To the other churches that we studied earlier, Christ then goes on to list some of those good deeds. And he said things like patience. I know your patience. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faithfulness. And etc. But to Philadelphia, before he lists what they are doing for him, Jesus tells what he is doing for them. So what is Jesus doing for this church? Again, it's right in that verse, verse 8. I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. Well, we're back to open and shut doors again and keys. What is Jesus talking about here? <sighs> there are two main suggestions as to what this key and this door represent. The first is that this is the door to heaven, the door to the Father in heaven, to be exact. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way. And no one comes to the Father except how? Except through me. John 10, 9 makes it even clearer. I am the gate. New King James Version says, I'm the door. There's that word door again. I'm the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Is this the door Jesus is referring to? It's very possible. A second, a second explanation of this door, and the one I personally prefer, is that it is the door of opportunity. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9, states this, and I'm going to read these. I will stay on in Ephesus, because a great, here's the word, door for effective work has opened for me. Here, and again, in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, which states, I want, or I went to preach the gospel of Christ and found the Lord had opened a door for me. And Paul speaks of Jesus placing an open door, a door of opportunity, a door through which he, Paul, can minister and serve those in the area. And that door is open, and it's right in front of him. Let's go back to Revelation 3, verse 8. We're right there. Even if you combine the two interpretations of door, either a doorway to, to, to the Father in heaven, or a doorway to opportunities to spread the gospel to other people or serving other people, Jesus is telling this group in Philadelphia that he has not only opened for them a door, whether to heaven, he has opened a door for them to bring others to him even if you combine the two. And the door is staring them right in the face. All they have to do is walk through it. Coronavirus, believe it or not, is a door. What door has coronavirus opened in people's lives? You know, it used to be you get together with people, they talk about everything but things like this. They talk about sports. Or we talk about, oh man, I can't wait to my vacation. Well, nobody's talking about vacations anymore. And nobody's talking about sports anymore. People have a different mindset these days because of coronavirus. People are talking to their neighbors, even over the phone. People are talking to co-workers if they can get together. People are talking to their kids and the subject isn't sports. People are thinking beyond those things. Life beyond this life is becoming an area of conversation. What happens if I get it? Because of this virus, we have doors wide open that before were either closed 
or which we perceived as closed or which we were totally ignoring even though they were open. Jesus then, then gives some reasons why this church has been given this open door. Still in verse 8, what are the reasons for the open door? Let me short, shorten that list so it'll fit on the board. I'm going to put three words on the board and we'll see that and then we'll go through them. You can hear me? That's weak. Obedient. And loyal. Weak, obedient, and loyal. You have little strength. You're weak. You have kept my word. You're obedient. And you haven't denied my name. You're loyal. You're faithful. Some of you may have watched Sesame Street. I know it's been a few years for most of us, but you may have kids or grandchildren, and maybe you're young enough to watch it yourself when you were that age. And one of the songs in Sesame Street is, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Look at that list we just have on the board. Which one doesn't seem to fit? We have deeds, weak, obedient, and loyal. Which one doesn't seem to fit? For me, it's weak. You are weak. You have little strength. That just doesn't seem to fit with the rest. This is one of the good points on their report card. You are weak. Why is being weak considered a positive by Christ? This church in Philadelphia is a small congregation in a small farming community. Can you see similarities to any church you know? A small congregation in a small farming community. Now, sometimes we think, you know, our church here isn't really doing much. We're not all that important to the work of Jesus. We're weak in numbers. We're weak in impact. When we compare First Baptist to some of the bigger congregations around, churches like Sherwood Park Alliance or Millwoods Community Church, used to be Millwoods Pentecostal Church, or some of the monster churches in the United States and across the world with 10,000 people attending on a, on a Sunday morning. When you compare yourself to them, you know, it's easy to feel that what we do here really doesn't amount to a row of beans. Do you ever feel that way about our church? Do you ever feel that way about yourself? Do you? I know I do at times. Do you? Jesus clearly points out that he doesn't rate a church negatively because of its size or because of its strength. But what else are they praised for? There they are. You are obedient. You are loyal. You have kept my word. You haven't den denied my name. You know, this church in Philadelphia is a small, weak congregation, yet they remain faithful to Christ. And I did some thinking about this preparing this lesson. I find that God, more often than not, uses weaker rather than more powerful people to accomplish great things for himself. Can you think of any examples from the Bible of where God called a weaker person to a great job, a great mission, rather than a powerful person to do that same work? I think of David. David. A pipsqueak teenage shepherd. And who does he go up against? A trained military giant, Goliath. And this pipsqueak shepherd, with all he has is a sling in his hand, stands up to this giant mammoth of a man. I think of Moses, 80 years old, afraid to speak in public. And yet he's called to, to lead a nation, an entire nation. I think of other people, Gideon, Ruth, Nehemiah, think of where he started from, a cupbearer, and the list goes on and on. Why does God use weaker people rather than those more powerful to accomplish great things for himself? Why does he use the weaker people? You know, over the past while, 
Linda and I have been dog sitting two dogs of a good friend of ours. The two dogs' names are Willow and Buddy. Now, Willow is a small little dog about this big, weighs about 10 pounds. And she just likes to lay on the couch and sleep all day for the most part. Buddy, on the other hand, is twice the size, much, much younger, only two years old, and has a lot of energy. Now, Willow and Buddy, they love each other and they get along really well. But there's times when Buddy is just so energetic, so rambunctious, that Willow finally has had enough and just snaps at him. And then Buddy just cowers back, okay? I, I've been told. And Willow, even though it's half the size, has that kind of an influence on Buddy, who's twice the size. There's an old saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but what? It's the size of the fight in the dog. It's not the size of the church in the fight, but the size of the fight in the church. And I don't mean fighting the way you might think it is. Your power, what you draw from. So does that mean we should be content, even try to remain a small, weak church? Well, look at verse 8. Christ opens doors. If we go through those open doors, we cannot help but grow. But let's keep moving. Let's read verse 9. Go ahead, Linda. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Okay, we discussed all this back a few, a few uh, weeks ago. But as a review, believers were being opposed by people of Jewish nationality at, at that time. Jewish people were and still are God's chosen people. However, there were Jewish people in Smyrna, which is what the Linda was reading about, a church in Smyrna. There were people in, in Smyrna and now in Philadelphia, and they were Jewish people who were opposing the work of God. In essence, they were working for Satan by doing that. So Jesus tells this church, go out and fight against these people, right? Well, look at the verse. He doesn't say that at all. What does Christ say here? I, I will look after this. I will make them fall at your feet. I will show them that I have loved you. As their father, God will discipline his children. And he will make it right. And that's a promise. Let's carry on. Verse 10, please. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Okay. This church has one more good point mentioned here. Do you see it? You have kept my command to, what's the words? Endure patiently. I'm just putting short that. Enduring. Enduring. And because of their patient endurance, Jesus gives them a promise. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, what in the world is this hour of trial that Jesus is talking about? Well, some say that this refers to the Roman persecution that the early church went through and was still going through and was still going to happen in the future at the time John writes this. And that this uh, hour of trial is a reference to, to that Roman persecution. But there's a major, major problem with that view. Look at verse 10 again. How far does this hour of trial extend? How far does it reach? If your Bible is the same as mine, it says the whole world. Roman persecution never stretched that far. But this hour of trial will. This almost certainly, certainly is a reference to the time still coming, which is referred to as the Great Tribulation. The Bible speaks of this period of time where the whole earth will undergo unprecedented chaos. You think it's bad now? Read Revelation, because much of Revelation describes that time. But this church is, is promised that they will be kept from that time. Now what does that mean? They will be kept from that time. 
The wording in this verse, kept from, can mean they will not have to go through that hour of trial. Or it could also mean they will be kept while they go through it. Really clear in the wording from the Greek. So let me just put up on the up on the board this promise. They will be kept, whether through or from. It's, it's not really clear. But here we get into the deep discussion of whether Christ will return for his church before, during, or after the Great Tribulation. In other words, when will the rapture take place? Will Christians be around for the Great Tribulation that the Bible speaks about? Or won't they? Now I have a mountain of verses at home I could give you which support each of the various viewpoints. Some say, well, it has to happen. The church will be taken away before the Great Tribulation. Others are adamant. It must happen after the Tribulation. Christians will go through it. And some say, well, it's right in the midst. And there's verses to support all of them. And it's a major study, a major study, which we just won't be able to deal with adequately today. There's just viewpoints, and I can't say one is right over the other. I just can't. However, we can look at this some other time as the opportunity presents itself. But we'll leave that at that. But this church is given the promise from Christ that whatever happens, he will protect them. Period. And what a promise that was. Pardon me, wrong tense. What a promise that is. Then Jesus gives them another promise. Then he gives them some advice. And then he gives them a warning. All in the next verse, verse 8, or pardon me, verse 11. Linda, if you could read that, please. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. There's a promise. I am coming soon. And then the advice, hold on to what you have. Then the warning, don't let anyone take your crown. I'm just going to say protect your crown. Protect your crown. What's the promise? I'm coming soon. He said that to most of the churches, actually. I'm coming soon. What's the advice? Hold on. Hold on to what you have. And the warning, don't let anyone take your reward. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about rewards. Don't let anyone take that crown that you've earned in what you've been doing. You know, this verse really struck me this week. As we see the world spiraling downward, seemingly out of control, or even prior to this virus, as society throws off and throws aside most of the standards of morality, most of the standards of integrity that we once knew and lived by, and as it, as it becomes harder and harder to stand for Christ in a world that has lost its way, we can read this verse from our Savior, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Don't let anyone take your crown. Anyone. Do you think what's happening in our world today surprises Christ? Not in the least. You know, this church in Philadelphia has everything they need. They have doors opening in front of them. They are remaining obedient, loyal, patiently enduring while they perform their deeds. And this church on the right track, so Jesus simply says, keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on. No big demands, no other expectations, just keep on doing what you're doing. And if you do, Jesus says, I have some prizes. I have some prizes waiting for you. You're bigger than this box. Or that box. And you don't have to guess what these prizes are. He tells us. Read verse 12, please. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never, never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God, 
and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. Rather than trying to put all those promises on the board, I'm just going to say Revelation 3, verse 12 is chock full of promises. Chock full of promises. What a list. Rather than try to put them on, I just put the verse. But there's a ton of prize, prizes Jesus promises here. Him who overcomes, the victor, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. What does that suggest to you? You will be a pillar in the temple of God. A pillar suggests permanency. You're standing. In the, where's the temple of God? It's in heaven. I will make you a pillar in the temple of God. You probably heard the phrase, no, he's a pillar in the church, or she's a pillar in the community. Well, this is where it comes from. This verse here. Overcomers are promised a place of permanent standing before God, right in the temple. And this is heaven. And look at what follows. He, she, will never, what? will never leave it. And then we have three names written on the victorious. Do you see them? The name of my God. The name of the city of my God, says the new Jerusalem. And finally Jesus says, I will write on them my new name. What do all these names written on the overcomer suggest to you? In the front of my Bible, I have my name written. Why? It's a sign of ownership. I also have my address. This is where I live. And I think this is what Christ is saying. Those who overcome, those who are victorious in this battle on this, on this earth, belong to God. He has signed his name on you to prove his ownership. And this is your address. This is where you will live one day. In the new Jerusalem that is being built right now by Christ for you. And you can read all about it in Revelation chapter 21. It's amazing how that New Jerusalem is described in that chapter. 1,500 miles wide by 1,500 miles long by 1,500 miles high. 12 gates made of single pearls each. And then 12 foundations made of precious stones then the, on the wall that surround the city. 1,500 in circumference on each side. And, and the wall around that, 200 feet thick. And 12 different foundations made of different gems from diamonds to sapphires, I can't remember what they all are, but they're all listed in chapter 21, you can read it. And then you have Jesus inside, and God inside, who are the light shining through all those crystals and through the pearls, and there's a golden street of gold. I mean, this is fantastic, what God is preparing for us, and this is where we don't want to call home. Now, this will be our new address, and our name is written on it. And then he says, we will also receive Jesus' new name. Flip over to chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to have Linda read that. We're very near the end here. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. Read that, please. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve them. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, doesn't that give you goosebumps? You can only imagine, or we can only imagine, what we have in store when Christ says, Open your boxes. Go on, open your boxes. I want you to open them. I want you to see what's in store for you. I better close this before I start jumping here. Then if you could read verse 13 of chapter 3, this will be our final verse. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What a wonderful report card to a weak little church. I'm sure after hearing some of the negatives of what Jesus had to say to the three previous churches in Pergamum, Thyatira, and especially in Sardis, the believers in Philadelphia must have been chewing their nails off waiting for their turn, waiting for the other shoe to draw. But notice, notice, does Jesus have any bad things to say about this church in Philadelphia? Not one. Does that mean they were a perfect church full of perfect people? Of course not. 
But this little church in Philadelphia is an inspiration to all of us who may get discouraged and feel that we're not big enough. We're not strong enough. We're not important enough, either as a church or as individuals, to make any real difference. We are important to Christ. And you can make a difference. I can make a difference. We have doors opening in front of us that no man can shut. All we have to do is walk through them. Let's close in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day where we can look into your word once again, even though it's not the way we normally do it. Thank you for the technology you've allowed us to have, that we can do this in a way that is still safe. And we thank you for this church in Philadelphia, who is such, which is such an example, to especially our church here, a small little church in Fredericksheim community. Help us to remember the advice that you give them. Help us to remember the good points that they are going through, or that they are obtaining, so that we can do the same thing. Help us to remember the deeds are important. Help us to remember that even though we're weak, we're not weak in your eyes. Help us to remember the importance of being obedient and to, to, to be loyal to you through everything, to, to patiently endure in all things. Help us to remember those things, Father. Help us to remember to hold on to what we do have and never let anyone take our crown. Because you have in store for us some wonderful promises, some wonderful surprises, and in one day we will all see them. As we go from this place, help us to keep healthy. And if you don't take, keep healthy, bring us home to you. We thank you so much again for this opportunity that we can study your word. This I pray in your name. Amen.